Good evening. Let's all stand together this evening. Take your hymn books. Turn to page 361. We'll sing the Lily of the Valley. Page 361. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The Lily of the Valley in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He all my griefs has taken and all my sorrows borne. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tongue. I have all for him forsaken and all my idols torn. From my heart and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me and Satan tempt me sore, through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here, while I live by faith and do his blessed will. Oh, all the fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With my manna, he my home. Then sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. All right, let's sing When I See the Blood, page 139 in your hymnal. Christ our Redeemer died on the cross, died for the sinner, paid all his due. Sprinkle your soul with blood of the Lamb, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, Chiefest of sinners, Christ was all he has promised that he will do. Wash in the fountain, hope and for sin, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood. I will pass over you. Judgment is coming, all will be there. Each one receiving justly is due. Hide in the saving, sin cleansing blood. And I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, pass, I will pass over you. Oh, great compassion, oh, boundless love, oh, loving kindness, faithful and true. Find peace and shelter under the blood, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I
Good evening to you. Thank you for being in church tonight. Sure is good to be back together with you. Let's bow our heads and uh, we'll ask the Lord's help in the service tonight. And then I think we'll sing one more song before missionary letters. But Luke, Lord, thanks for bringing us back to this place. Uh, Father, we have uh, sure have enjoyed the week. And uh, Lord, thank you for the things that have been done around here this week. But Lord, being able to gather like this one more time it sure, is, uh, sure is a blessing. Lord, we're thankful for it. God, I pray that you'd bless our time together. Uh, Father, those that are watching at home tonight, would you encourage their hearts, Lord, as they try to take part in the service. Lord, I pray for those that are here in this auditorium and those in the, <clears throat> in the classes downstairs. God, please, uh, please, you do the, the work on hearts tonight, Father. We look to you for that. Would you be glorified in all that we say and we do, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated for the song. Let's sing the old rugged cross. It's page 132 in your hymnal. One, three, two. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dear and past for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will clean attraction to me for the dear lamb of god left his glory upon to bear it to dark calvary so i'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I Suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to. Approach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away, where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last. I lay down. I will cling to the old wrong and cross and exchange it someday for a crown. All right. We have uh, 
some missionary letters <clears throat> we're going to read tonight. And uh, we also have a, uh, a video that we're going to show. If you have your, um, if you have your missionary update uh, sheet that you picked up in the back, maybe you have one of these binders already, and you can keep those in there. And uh, Brother Stephen, let's start putting the date on these, if, if we could, please, at the top, just so we uh, know which one we're on. So if, if, you, if you want one of these binders, we have some in the office. We're selling those for $5.00. And uh, that's not quite what it costs to make them, but I think it's a, I think it's a fair price if you want one of those just to keep all of your, your updates in. And uh, I find that helpful when I'm, when I'm praying. Um, I, I like having them all in one place, and so maybe you want to do that. And um, you can pick one of those up, see Brother Stephen, for that. But we have a, a video we're going to read. Or, no, we're not going to read the video. We're going <laughs> to show the video in just a few minutes. It's Brother Lee Cadenhead. Uh, before we do, Brother, my voice was fine all day long. Would you read these? Now, one of these is from the Chave family, and some of his words are hard to pronounce, so good luck. Thanks. All right. This should be interesting. The Chave family in Uruguay. We had a busy but very blessed summer. Seminary classes, the Pentateuch class pictured above, last December through the end of February. We also celebrated our church's 24th anniversary with baptisms and dinner on the ground, top right. Six believers were baptized that day, including our son, Zach. And uh, each of these refers to a picture. So as Pastor always says, you can come and get this, or you can look at this out on the, uh, the missions kiosk. We as a church also had the privilege of seeing Mark Perez, Pastor Archie and Ruth's son, ordained as a pastor. Later in the month, our church hosted our annual youth conference with about 80 young people in attendance from all over Uruguay. Twelve souls were saved during those three days of excellent preaching. Countless consecration decisions were made, one of them being our son Stephen, who dedicated his life to whatever the Lord has for him. We're so thankful for the leadership of David and Andre Andrea Gonzalez, who organized this retreat. And then they have a list of prayer requests. You want me to read those? Uh, Rebecca's teaching paperwork. There's no date uh, for the next committee meeting. Pray the Lord continues to prepare the way. Um, then corner property offering or offer. We are waiting for a response to our offer on the property. Pray for the owners to accept it as the Lord wills. And then back to school. A new school year has begun. Pray for protection for our children. Then praises. It says Fellowship Baptist Church of Clark Lake gave a special offering allowing us to buy 50 folding chairs for seating in the temple edition. And then for physical protection. We had COVID last month, but have recovered and are back to normal. So that's from the Gabriel Shavi family in Uruguay. Then our next letter is from the Bauckhams, uh, missionaries to the North American natives. Dear Pastor Church and friends of Tom and Elaine, it has a verse here at the top. It says, In the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. That's 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Then it begins, one of these days, the church here is going to have to call a pastor, preferably a native man, whether it be one of the two men we have or seek outside the church. They have never had a native pastor. It, was always, it has always been a white man or, or Caucasian. I am not much help these, these days except to advise them of what is needed to be done here. COVID in the harsh winter has really hampered the ministry. People just are not comfortable opening the doors to strangers and getting them to church. The church wanted to rent the church house out as we have not lived in it for nine years. We, we have our church office there and keep it ready for visiting preachers, evangelists, and visitors from the south. Two women heard that the church was thinking of renting it, so they started attending. They looked sort of charismatically to me. charismatic -y. <laughs> I don't know that I've ever read that, read that word before. <laughs> the church got excited about it, and I told them they had better check them out. They almost closed the deal, and I found out they were charismatic and Pentecostal. They were going around having women's conferences, and only the Lord knows what else. <laughs> They came to church one night with a contract drawn up, ready to move in. They were bold and pushy. When they saw that we were not going to rent now, they left. Well, enough of this. Both me and my wife 
are not much better health-wise. Some days we both get so depressed and don't know what to do. But God sure has been good to me and Elaine. We look forward to going to church and thank God we have two men that are fired up and excited about preaching. I have enclosed a, enclosed a couple of new prayer cards and some more pictures on the back. Elena started her ECT, electroconvulsive therapy again. It's helping her, but it's hindering her memory. There is much she does not remember yet. But the doctor said most of her memory would return in time. Many thanks and appreciations go out to all that keep praying, texting, and calling. Thanks for coming to our rescue, a special offering in these dark and sad days. I can't understand why God loves worms like us. He has some references here for Job and Isaiah. I assume I'm reading the back too. All right. All right, on the back it says, Dear friends, we just wanted to make sure that we thanked you all that prayed and gave to us for and for us the last three months as we continue to tromp through the snow here in Canada. We do not get our receipts for the donors for a month after they, re after they receive them from you. The office keeps a record, and we keep a record too, but sometimes somebody gets overlooked. Here's a great big thank you, even if you have already got a thank you from Elaine and I. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The pictures are just to give you an idea of who's who. One of these men will probably be the next pastor of this church. Pray that God would lead the church. Pray for us a downstairs apartment, please. We have crawled these stairs for 10 years. We're tired, but still doing what we can at snail speed. Tom and Elaine Bauckham. Thank you, Luke. The, uh, some of the pictures in that letter, he just read uh, the stairs that they've been going up to. It looks like... Um, it looks like a set of fire escape stairs that you see strapped to the building in New York. It's what it just real rickety looking steps, and uh, it, uh, they're just in they're, they're they're getting older and their health is failing, so I have to go up and down those steps every time you leave the house. It's trying on them, and I've I've had them on my prayer list for their health for a long time, but I uh, got that that prayer letter about a month ago, and I've had on my prayer list uh, a first floor apartment for them. It's very expensive there, very expensive. And so that's uh, the biggest restriction on them getting where they need to be. So a lot to pray about for the, uh, for the, the Balkans. If you think it was funny reading about the Pentecostal ladies, um, you should hear him talk about it. It is, it is so funny. Uh, of course, he's just a Southern, really soft-spoken guy. And so when he starts talking about uh, the, the, them and their, their women's conferences and stuff, it, 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 just the way he says things, it's so, so funny to me. All right, so we're going to watch this video now. This is from Brother Lee Cadenhead. They are in Zimbabwe. And uh, they've been there for just a couple of weeks now. And uh, he sent this video to me, I think it was last week. And I asked him if it was all right if I showed the church. And he said he'd be overjoyed for the church to see it. I think it's a little bit long. It's about eight, eight and a half minutes long. And, um, but it'll tell you what's going on with them. We were the very first supporting church for the, for the Caden Heads. And uh, they announced they were going to the mission field. He was pastoring down in Alabama. Then he was at a church, on, on staff at a church in Carthage, Tennessee and um, Cornerstone Baptist Church in Carthage. And um, from there, he surrendered to go to Zimbabwe. And he called me on the phone, and he said he just wanted me, wanted me to hear from him and said through the grapevine that they had surrendered to go. And I said, well, brother, have you, have you started candidating yet? And he said, no, I haven't really. And that was on a Wednesday. And I said, well, how about this evening at church? Um, how about you just join us through Zoom, and we'll be your first church. And so we were, he didn't have any presentation. He had nothing formalized. And uh, but church, y'all you, you know who he is. He's been a help to us in several of our meetings, and so uh, you, there, was, there was no issue taking him off for support. And I'm glad we did. I'm glad we did. And then, and then uh, because of uh, your faithfulness and faith missions giving, we were able just to pay for their airline tickets to get to Zimbabwe and last year. Just be able to send them a check, and um, that was that was a blessing. So anyway, you've heard me talk about all that before, but now you get to hear it from Brother Cadenhead himself. So go ahead and play that video, Brother Steve. Mangwanani, that is good morning in Shona to all of our supporting pastors, churches, and prayer partners. I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I've been meaning to get you a, a short update about our transition to Zimbabwe. We entered the country on the 28th of March. It, there are no easy ways to get here. It's a lot, a lot of uh, uh, international travel. So we traveled from Nashville to Dallas 
from Dallas to Doha, Qatar, from Doha, Qatar to Lusaka, Zambia, and finally touched down in Harare, Zimbabwe on about mid midday, uh, Monday, March 28. And uh, we were greeted there by Brother Jeffrey Porter, Brother Bill Smith. They helped us get our all of our stuff, lots of bags between our family and the Rich family who is traveling with us, who's here with us on their protracted survey trip. And so I spent, our family spent two full days in Harare sorting some of the paperwork that we needed to get done. We were able to get our temporary employment permit passport stamps, which is a great answer to prayer. Um, if you recall, we had been told back in January that our uh, temporary employment permit application had been lost. And then we found out in early March that it had not been lost, but that it had been improved for a year back in October. So we have the permit that we need to stay here. It is renewable uh, in country. And once we hold that for a certain number of years, we can apply for permanent residence here and don't have to jump through the hoops of having that permit renewed year by year, every other year, however that works out uh, upon the renewal. So that is a great answer to prayer. We found our vehicle in good working order. We were able to initiate the registration of the vehicle and get some other paperwork done in the Capitol over those couple of days. And so that went well. We proceeded here to Matari. We were, um, uh, the, the Rich family had already come to Matari and gotten, had gotten settled in here. So we got here on the 31st of March on Thursday. And uh, one of the things that we had asked you to pray about was the housing situation uh, that only came together and in, in over the last month, basically, prior to our transition. And we were able to secure a property um, that includes a sizable house, a smaller cottage, and uh, a large yard. And so our family is staying in the house. The rich family is staying in the cottage, and our f children are able to play together here in this large yard. Uh, we've been doing, as a family, we've been sharing some meals, been doing our devotions together. Twice a week, we have language lessons, which our families are able to participate in together. And then uh, myself, Brother Cody, and Owen, we go out each day and do witnessing, and we found a good reception. This is a place where people will slow down, have conversations with you. So we've worked different areas of the city. The house is uh, wonderfully located. It's in a safe and secure area. It's um, up, up, up against the uh, base of a mountain here, and then we're just a few minutes drive from the center, center of town where we're doing evangelism. Uh, just yesterday, we went to a uh, open air building supply and hardware market called Green Markets, and so um, we were out there just doing evangelism. It's so refreshing. Uh, for me, I found pockets of men that were resting from their labor. It was toward the end of the day and uh, would just approach them, pass out tracks to each of them, and then engage in conversation, look for the strongest personality in the group and have some back and forth. And in some cases, I was able to back up and just rear back and preach the gospel to some attentive hearers and with some with some back and forth. So it's been a joy so far doing evangelism. We're compiling names of contacts, and uh, at some point in the near future, we hope to begin a regular Bible study or a preaching point. We're not ready to launch a, a local church as yet, but uh, once we do have that Bible study going, we will uh, communicate with these folks that we've dealt with in town. So I feel like our families are adjusting uh, wonderfully. Our children did exceptionally well for the long uh, international travel. Um, our wives have settled in uh, very nicely and are adjusting well. Uh, every part of this transition has just been uh, very much blessed of the Lord. Um, because we don't have a local church to attend here in Mutari as yet, uh, we traveled last Sunday and we'll travel again this coming Sunday, two hours to our south to Chipingi, where we have attended or have, have attended and will attend uh, again the Solid Rock Baptist Church 
the church which uh, missionary Jeffrey Porter has established, some tremendous things going on there. I was able to preach uh, for Solid Rock this past Sunday, and we'll be back there. We, the 12 of us, our two families load up in our seven-seat Fortuner, African style, and make that uh, two-hour harrowing journey. Uh, driving in Africa is certainly a, a different kind of experience, but we're doing well. Um, if you've ever been on a foreign mission trip, you might relate to the idea of just feeling like you're completely out of place and like you sort of don't belong, sort of awkward, almost almost anxious. And uh, I experienced that the first time that I came to Africa. But um, I praise the Lord that this time I don't feel any of that. Uh, I feel like I'm home. The, the, even things that would might otherwise be a bit frustrating, like uh, driving and the pace of life here, um, I, I'm... I, the Lord's allowed me to enjoy those things, and so we're adapting uh, very well. Uh, we enjoyed our time at Solid Rock Baptist Church in Chipingi, uh, getting to see some familiar faces that we've communicated with and uh, get, gotten to spend some time with. In the past, we're really thankful for the assistance of uh, Brother Jeffrey Porter and his wife Cindy and for Brother Bill Smith, who was here and has now returned to the States, and they've been a big help to us as we've tried to get settled in here. Um, there are other ministry opportunities that are developing. Um, I have an invitation, or I have accepted an invitation from Pastor Rosert, whom I've worked with in previous trips. They do a large Easter gathering, a, uh, a, a Bible uh, conference or special meeting around Resurrection Sunday. So next week, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, um, the Rich family will go to Solid Rock, spend some time with the Porters. Our family will go to Triangle, about a four and a half or five hour drive from here in Mutari, and uh, we'll conduct a conference there. So looking forward to that. The Lord's opening many doors. Um, the Lord has made, honestly, the Lord's made our transition to Zimbabwe pretty easy. Uh, everything has fallen into place, and we're grateful we attribute this to the prayers of God's people. And we can't tell you how grateful we are for your support and for your faithful prayers, and they're making a difference in our lives. Thank you for holding the ropes for us, and uh, thank you for praying for us here. Uh, the Lord is blessing, and we're grateful. Uh, please send our regards to the church is there, and uh, our please communicate our thanks for your prayers and support. And we hope to send you many more good reports in the future. You'll get a prayer letter with uh, further information, including a bit of an update on that uh, Easter conference that we've been asked to participate in. So that'll be forthcoming in a few weeks here. Uh, we love you. We thank God for you. Uh, thank you again for your prayers and for your support and for getting us here to Zimbabwe. Lord bless. That's Brother Caden Head. I got to meet me, Brother Caden Head, Brother Logan, and a couple other preachers, uh, uh, James Hoffmeister and Rick Baker. We preached at um, a Bible conference together down at Brother Knox back in, I think it was January. And I got to spend some time with Brother Cadenhead, and not, not just Brother Cadenhead, but his family as well. And they are just a joy to be around, uh, from, from the youngest to the oldest uh, the kids. I mean, they are just they were just excited to get to the mission field. And that was it's, it's encouraging to see a 16-year-old boy um, not moping around about having to leave all his friends behind, but just excited to get there. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing more things from them uh, in, in the future about what the Lord is doing with them there in Zimbabwe. All right, well, let's stand together, please. And uh, those missionary prayer lists, we'll pray over those at the end of the service. And uh, why don't you greet one another, say hello to one another quickly, and then we'll get ready to receive our evening offering in, in just a moment.
hand. Let's sing that first verse together. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. You can be seated this evening. Come on, ushers. Let's go ahead and get our offering tonight. I want to remind everybody that we are going to send a few guys down to Brother Jeff Lynn's church in Slippery Rock, Pennsylvania. Uh, we're going to send them down probably Sunday night, maybe uh, early Monday, and uh, going to spend uh, three or four days down there uh, helping him hang some drywall in his auditorium ce uh, ceiling. And uh, if I understand him correctly, I think he's rented two scissors lists. Has, have any, either of you guys talked to him? Scissors lifts. He's, so uh, that'll save a lot of time, a lot, <laughs> so much work, um, hanging drywall. To have two of those, I think he's got. I think he's got two drywall jacks as well. I'm not sure, but um, so it'll be, it won't be like you're on a step ladder holding drywall above your head. It'll be a whole lot easier than that. But I think there's three or four guys wanting to go right now. Um, I've got to make some reservations at hotels. Um, to, tomorrow. And so if you want to go, if you're able to get a couple of days off, maybe Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, if you can get that off, you want to go down there, let me know tonight or first thing in the morning. And uh, we'll make sure we get a room reserved for you as well. We'll try to take care of all of your expenses while you're gone. And that'll be a tremendous help to Brother Jeff. Okay. All right. I think that's all of the announcements. Miss Heather, you're singing during the offering. All right. Father, thank you for the way you've blessed our church. God, thank you for the faithfulness and the giving of the people. Lord, you're able to take what we give and you're able to make it sufficient to meet the need and then so much more. Father, only you can do that and we give you the glory for it. Lord, we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.
in his hands and his feet. Mercy or justice, heaven or hell, I took forgiveness. Thank you, Heather. Take your Bibles this evening, please, and find two places. Uh, in the New Testament, find 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and then in your Old Testament, find Numbers 21. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and Numbers 21 will be in both of those places, and um, you might just save you some time and go ahead and find them. If you are an online viewer this evening, how about sending me a text message? Let me know that you're watching. I've already received several of them, and many times I forget to even ask for them. And so if you are watching from home this evening, um, uh, go ahead and send me a text message. Let me know that you're watching. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Numbers 21. All right. Father, we need your help for the next few minutes. Would you please, um, God, have your will in our lives as we try to study and then make application of your word. Lord, keep me from doing or saying anything that would just be my thoughts. Lord, we want you to speak to our hearts. We want you to convict our hearts. Lord, we want you to change us. So, Lord, that's our prayer, and we thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is where we will begin We'll grab a thought from that chapter, and then we will um, uh, then we'll go back to our Old Testament and probably spend the balance of our time there. We do have choir practice after service this evening, so I'll try not to go long this evening, and and uh, just so we get all of that in that we need. Uh, lots of text messages coming in right now. Thank you for that. Where the mountains are watching in in New Jersey, very faithful listeners there in New Jersey, and uh, the Keeters and the Douglases and several other people are, are watching as well. Thank you for those. First Corinthians chapter ten. If you're looking at that, say amen. amen. All right. Let's start reading in verse one. It says, "Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should uh, be ignorant." how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink. Um, I'm sorry, they did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. There is... So much right there. We, we, I, I'm not exaggerating, church. We could preach a series of 12 sermons from what we just read. And yet, I don't even want to try to start in those verses. We need to get a little bit further down. But let me say this. Not preaching this, but the fact that these verses exist ought to put to rest the hyper-dispensationalist position that anything in the Old Testament is just that. It's Old Testament and has no use to us today. There are those who believe that. We believe in dispensations, but we do not take the hyper-dispensationalist view that those things which happen in one dispensation can in no way make their way into the new dispensation. These verses should put that to rest. The Apostle Paul, writing to a New Testament church, points to the Old Testament and says... I don't want you to be ignorant of what happened because those things happened for our example. That's what Paul says. That, in my opinion, takes a large chunk of the foundation away from those who think that what happened in the Old Testament have no bearing on us today. It says, 
and I, I, I listen, I just, the end of verse four, it doesn't say, it, it, it flat out says that the spiritual meat and drink that sustained those people in the wilderness was not God the Father, it was not God the Holy Spirit, it was Christ. If you're looking for Christ in your Old Testament, there he is. He sustained them. In their journey through the wilderness with all their problems, it says that that rock was Christ. I love it. Oh, I could preach it. I could preach it right now. Verse five though. But with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. I'd say that was pretty good evidence that God's not pleased with you. God flat out told all of those faithless people who refused to trust him, he said, your carcasses, the Bible words, not mine, your carcasses will fall in this wilderness. That's a good indicator that you've, you've messed up. When God says you're going to die in this wilderness, that's a pretty good indicator. Verse six, here it is. Now, these things were our examples to the intent to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Very, very interesting verse there. Verse seven, neither be ye idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and 20,000. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. And then it says again, now all these things happened unto them for our ensamples and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. You know what we just read right there? Those Old Testament books, they weren't written for the Old Testament people. Now those things happened and those people should have learned from their lessons, but God had it carefully recorded, not for them. He had it recorded for us. It says these things were written for us, for our admonition. And then if I could draw your attention to two words that are different, and so that means they have different meanings. The first time, but we'll just flip back over to verse six. Now, these things were our examples, E-X, examples. Flip back over now to verse 11. Now, all these things happened unto them for our ensamples. Look right here just for a moment. If you have a King James Bible that uses those two different words, you ought to thank God you do. The, the words are not the same. And the, the difference, is, difference is not only in spelling, it's different in meaning. The same, the, listen, listen to me very, very carefully. The same Holy Spirit that inspired the penman to use the word example in verse six is the same Holy Spirit that inspired the penman to use the word in samples there in verse 11. All right, if you want to remove the Holy Spirit from the equation, I, I, I discourage you from doing that. But if you want to do that and just look at it purely through human eyes, the same penman that used the word examples in verse six, and just a couple of sentences later, the same penman used the word in samples. Now, either we got a penman who doesn't know vocabulary, doesn't know how to use words, or it just might be that he's smarter than we are. We just need a good dictionary to help us understand why he used those words. But you only have to go down that road if you remove the Holy Spirit from the equation. But we don't do that. We just say the Holy Spirit inspired the penman to use two different words. Here's the difference in the words. The word example means to take a, to, to, to take a, uh, a sample out of a pool 
and set aside as an example of what will be. The word ensample, it is the same as, in fact, if you look up an old dictionary, it actually uses the word of scar, the principle of an event that has happened to, to cause us to remember. You see the difference? An example is a sample taken from a a pool, uh, a whole bunch of things. Let's draw out just a couple of these things to show you and teach you. An end sample is, is as though God gave you a burning, lasting memory of something. We have the best of both worlds here. We start by saying, God, out of all those Old Testament scriptures, here's a few examples of what God has given us to teach us what to do and what not to do. And after he explains it all, all of the don't do these things, he says these things serve as an ensample, as though, as though it is a painful memory of what has happened, not to someone else, but to us. I wish we could... I wish we could get a hold of this. Now, the apostle Paul is talking to the entire Corinthian church. He uses words like ye and you and us and we. He's talking to the whole group of people. He says, church, God has brought us from a place that was full of our mistakes and errors. Don't ever pretend like those things didn't happen to you. Learn from them. And so we have this this best of both worlds, and I can't spend any more time on those two differences. You can compare them on your your own time. This evening, I want to start, we won't get very far, but I want to start at looking at some of these examples and in samples about things that happened that were written for our admonition, some things that we are told to not do, to not do. And we have... We have such good examples of it because Scripture recorded it for us. Now go to Numbers 21. Numbers 21. Uh, Verse 9, let me read it. As you're finding Numbers, let me read it to you one more time. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Let's look at Numbers 21 this evening, and this is one of many examples of... Uh, the people tempting God. Let's begin reading in verse one. It says, and when King Arad, the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell that Israel came by the way of the spies, then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, "If uh, if, if thou wilt indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites and and they utterly destroyed them under uh, and their cities. And he called the name of the place Hormah. Verse four. And they journeyed from Mount Hor uh, by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses, wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither are, neither there are any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. And the, Lord, and the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, <clears throat> and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. I have always been struck by that last phrase of verse five. I, it's, it's absolutely amazing to me that these people know that God lets this bread fall from heaven for them. It had never happened before, but because they needed something to eat, God said, I will literally send it from the, from the sky. And these people have reached such a state that in their, in, in their moment of emotion, they say, we hate this bread. We despise this. We, we loathe this bread. How in the world did that happen? Well, let's look at what led them there. 
And I would even say to you, as we look at three or four steps in this progression that led them to this tempting of the Lord, I think it'll be very easy for us to draw some parallels to our lives. God has never sent bread from heaven to me in the physical sense, but God has been awfully good to me. He's been so good to me. And in spite of his goodness to me, sometimes I find myself saying, this isn't fair. I do not like what I'm doing right now. I do not like what God is doing in my life right now. We got to be careful of these things. Let's look at this together. First of all, we see discouragement begin to set in. The Bible says there in the verse four, it says the soul of the people <clears throat> was much discouraged because of the way. The soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Now, this is, this is very interesting because they've just come out of a great victory. I mean, the Lord, this, this is not an army we're talking about. This is a group of people who at just a short time before had been slaves. They, they, they were not a trained army. They, were not, they, they weren't military. And yet God delivered this great enemy into their hands. They destroyed them completely. And then the very next thing we read, <clears throat> we read about is them complaining because the, the way was so hard and it discouraged them. Let me say two things about discouragement before we move on. Number one, discouragement can happen to anyone. Anyone. We, we sometimes can interchange the word discouraged and depressed. Discouragement will lead to depression. And that can happen to anyone, including you. You might be all happy and, and on the mountaintop right now, but all it's going to take is the wrong phone call and you'll begin that descent and it begins with discouragement. So the first thing is discouragement can happen to anyone. Number two, when people are discouraged, they say things they don't really mean. If you take notes, please write that down. It's so, it's so elementary, and yet it is so profound. When people are discouraged, they say things they do not mean. Here's why I want to point that out. That person that shoots their mouth off at you, makes you so mad and offends you, instead of... Instead of telling yourself how mean and hateful and immature they are. Instead, try telling yourself, I bet they have something going on in their life that I don't know about. Instead of assuming the worst in people, especially a brother or sister in Christ, maybe you ought to sit back and say, I wonder if they are just a little discouraged right now. See, instead of taking it as an insult, you could take it as a hint. We are so good about putting our, our uh, my, my brother-in-law Daniel uses the, uses the phrase church nice. We're so good about putting our church nice on. You know, we can be, we can, our lives can be falling apart. And on Sunday morning, we're gonna get up. Ladies will do their hair, put their lipstick on, put their nice clothes on, come to church and smile and sing, oh, how I love Jesus. A guy can, can, his job can be going nowhere. He can be discouraged in marriage, discouraged at work, discouraged and come to church and stay in the church pew, or not in the pew, but stand in, in, stand in, the, in the aisle and, and sing, and can it be? And we don't have any idea what's going on in someone's personal life. These people never would have said what they said had their soul not already been discouraged because of the way. The way gets hard, people. The way gets hard. And when we get discouraged, we begin to think and say things that if we were thinking clearly and soberly, we would never say. Things that we don't mean. It's important that we realize that. So first of all, the first step towards this tempting of God is the soul of the people was much discouraged. Number two, we find some distrust and doubts. And can I, can I tell you that the order of these things is very, very important. Because this is the way this goes. 
you never, you never doubt or distrust God when you're not discouraged. But when you're discouraged, you begin to really question if God is who he says he is and if he really is in control of what's going on in your life. When you're discouraged, things happen. Look what it says there. It says uh, in verse five, and the people spake against God and against Moses. What did they say about him? Well, wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? They begin to, they begin to vocalize the doubts they have about the big plan. Up and, I mean, coming out of that great victory, you know they were, they were all on board. They were all gung-ho. Yeah, let's go. God knows best. Boy, his plan sure is good. Look how he delivered these people. Let's get after it. In a short time later, the way has gotten hard. It's hot. They're thirsty. They're hungry. And now all of a sudden, they're starting to second guess. The discouragement sets in. Now they begin to second guess the plan that they were just before so in favor of. So, so here it is. Here's what you need to know. The hard way does not change God's all-sufficient hand of provision. The hard way does not, does not change God's ability. And I could just say this as well. The hard way was not indicative of sin. Show me between the great victory and the discouragement. Show me where they sinned. The Bible says nothing about it. This was just life as normal. And they got discouraged. And when they got discouraged, they began to doubt. When you begin to doubt God's plan and design for your life, hey, listen, that verse in the Bible that says all things work together for good, it would be great if that meant that that flat tire on the side of the road, that really is gonna work out for my good by the end of this day. Wouldn't it be great if that's what it meant? That's not what it means. That, that might work in your little trivial flat tire scenario, but you go next to the hospital bed of somebody who the doctor says, you're not getting better. And, and, and they're, they're slipping, their condition gets worse and worse. And you t look that person in the eye and say, uh, well, you know what the Bible says, all things work together for good. So don't worry about this, you're gonna get better, you'll be out of here in no time. That's not what the verse means. The verse means that when God is all done with this thing we call life, those believers, those children of God will stand back and look at the Lamb of God on the almighty throne of heaven and say, yep, worked out pretty good for me. That's what the verse means. In the end of everything, God's way will be better. But what happens between now and then, we have no guarantee of. No guarantee of. The way is gonna get hard. And you may find yourself a little discouraged, but don't allow yourself to start doubting scripture, doubting the goodness of God, doubting the, the almighty hand of God. That's what these people began to do. They were discouraged. And next thing you know, they begin to ask those questions. Why do you even bring me out here? Who's running this show? Uh, were there, was, there, was there no graves in Egypt? Was there not enough places for us to be buried there? Is that why you brought us out here? No faith in God whatsoever. God hadn't changed. In fact, if you go back and read in Genesis where God told Abraham, your descendants are gonna go into bondage. They're gonna be there for 400 years and then I'm gonna bring them out and I'm gonna give them a land all their own. God told them the plan 400 years before. God knew what he was doing, but the people were discouraged. And when the people get discouraged, the people begin to question God. Has he forgotten about us? Does he not really have a plan after all? Is all of this meaningless, all the fighting, all the struggle, all the labor? What is it, what's the point of all this? 
and you will find yourself asking those same questions. I don't mean when, when the car breaks down. I, I, don't, I don't mean when something breaks at the house or some trivial misfortune happens. I mean when your world seems to be falling apart. You better be careful what you say I'll never say because I know plenty of good people who have found themselves in a place they never thought they'd be in. Never thought they'd be there. My mind is, 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 I'm thinking about a brother in Christ, a, a pastor friend of mine, who several years ago called me in the middle of the night, weeping, just, just weeping, because his world had begun to crumble. And he said things like, I, I know what the Bible says. I know the scriptures. I know what I tell people who tell me the things I'm telling you right now. And none of it seems to matter right now. That's what happened to Israel. They got discouraged because of the way. And then they began to question everything they knew to be true just a little bit before. I'd say when they watched the waters of the Red Sea crash back down the Egyptians, they were pretty sure God could take care of them. I'm pretty sure when God delivered them miraculously from the Amorites, pretty sure they knew God would take care of them. Pretty sure when, 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 when this king, uh, Arad, when they defeated him, I'm pretty sure they could sit back and say, yeah, God can take care of us. But they forgot about all of it because the way was hard. Discouragement began to set in. And then following discouragement will always come distrust, doubt. Next will come the devaluation of God's provision. And there's that statement. For there is no bread, that was a lie. Neither is there any water, that was a lie. And our soul loatheth this light bread. What they, what they were meaning, and remember, they're speaking from discouragement. They're speaking from emotional hurt. And they say things they don't really mean. They did have bread. By the end of the verse, they confess they have bread. They just don't like it. They did have water. If they didn't have water, they'd be dead. What they mean is we don't have enough water or we don't have the water we want. They began to devalue God's provision. I, I remember a man in uh, the church my dad pastored in Indiana. He, he uh, had lost his job and the factory was closing and things were getting tight and he got picked up on a, on a construction crew just doing manual labor, but one of the things he had to have was a pair of work boots. And they had, they had no money at all. And he came to church one Wednesday night and was just so excited that he, a neighbor had called and said, hey, I've got this pair of work boots. They've hardly ever been worn. And uh, they're, they're whatever size it was, and they just happened to be Jim's size. And, and he hadn't picked them up yet, but he was so excited God had met that need came back to church on Sunday and dad said, you get those boots? Here's what he said. Yeah, I got those boots, but they were whatever brand was and they're not going to hold up. How do you go from rejoicing that God met a need that very few people even knew you had to complaining about God's provision? Well, right there, the way got hard, began to have doubts. And then as God met your need, you don't really appreciate it. It's not what you want. Begin to devalue that. You better be careful. You better be careful. The word tempt, I've got a definition here that I'd like to give you. The word tempt, uh, is, as it's used in our Bible, it's used in, in two or three different ways. The way it's used there in 1 Corinthians 10, where it says, where it's, where it's referencing this story, the way it's used there simply means uh, to, to provoke or to incite, to provoke or incite, uh, incite rather. Um, it, can you imagine these people? And, and God, listen, you can't tempt God to lure him into wickedness. God can't be tempted. The Bible says this very, very clearly. But these people tempted God in the fact that in spite of all he was doing with them and for them, they still just began to prod him and say, we want more. We want it our way. And that God is a long-suffering God, but he has limits. 
And they tempted him and tempted him and tempted him and tempted him. And finally, God said, I've had enough. Let me prove to you that your life really isn't that bad. Enter the fiery serpents. By about an hour into the fiery serpent ordeal, I will guarantee you everybody in that camp was much more willing to go back to the way things were without any complaining or grumbling. They tempted God. And according to 1 Corinthians 10, it was written down in your Bible for you to learn from. It was written in our Bible for me to learn from. So here's what we need to learn as we close. Number one, when the way gets hard, you better be on guard for discouragement. Number two, when you find yourself discouraged, don't allow that discouragement to cause you to doubt God and his plan. And then number three, don't ever allow yourself to get to the point where you're no longer thankful for the provision of God. When you find yourself right there, you're on dangerous ground and you might just be guilty of beginning to tempt God, and push God and incite God. You better be careful. The Bible says to the church, that was written down for our admonition for our learning. So I say we learn from it. I say we learn from it. Let's stand together, please. Would you bow your heads, please? I don't think we'll have an invitation this evening. But with your heads bowed and your eyes closed as I close in prayer, it might be great just to ask the Lord to burn these things into your heart and into your mind because the day is coming when the way will be hard. How we deal with that hard way, boy, it really matters. It really matters. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, it's always, it's always just exactly what we need. And uh, Father, I pray that you would help me remember these things. For when life is good, it's, it's not hard to trust you. It's not hard to be thankful. But Lord, when our way gets hard, when it gets rough, Lord, I pray that you would remind us of your goodness to us. Lord, help us recognize discouragement as it begins to set in and keep us from these things we've seen tonight. Lord, we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, go grab a prayer list. Brother Jerry's going to lead us in prayer in just a moment.